Hello, my name is Mauricio Muñoz, and today we will talk about of a mass spring damper system, and we will make use of the poor Hamiltonian approach. We will see how the energy flow from one domain to another domain. We will see how the system is interconnected. For this, I will make use of a virtual board. Let's start with a simple case. Let's say that we have a mass, just a regular mass, with value m. This mass is interconnected with a spring to the ground. And this spring also is a linear spring, which has a constant k. But also the mass will be connected to a damper, also a linear damper, to the ground. And this damper also has a constant dissipation value. We will call it b. Now, the mass is not moving right now, but we can always apply a force. So this input force, we will call it, we will call it U. This is a simple system. It's a, it's a system of dimension one, which means that, that all the constants, K and B, are just real numbers. And they are, and also they are necessarily more or equal than zero, and also b can be more or equal than zero. We can just explore the concept with, with, with uh, Newtonian physics, meaning that mass by acceleration, by the acceleration explored by the, uh, felt by the mass, is going to be just equal to all the sum of forces, the amount of forces um, I that goes from 1 to the total amount of forces, capital N. And so we call them this Fi. The summation of all the forces is just equal to the mass by deceleration. Here, if we apply a force to the mass, it means that the mass will have movement. We have um, a movement that we will call Q. This is just a regular displacement, which means that if we have the time derivative of Q, then we will have also a speed over the mass, and we will call it q dot, where q dot is just the time derivative of q. In this case, q then depends on time, and q also is just or has only dimension 1. Now, what are the forces affecting on the mass? For that, we can always make a, a free body diagram. So we will have the mass, again, the mass, and here we will have a force that is affecting the mass u. Also, we can say, we can say that there is a, a force exerted by the spring, by the linear spring, and also we will have a force exerted, exerted by, the, by, the, by the damper. And these forces, of course, is an action-reaction force interacting with the ground. And so this is, we can call this also our input force, F1, our input force. Now, if we define this, we know that just from physics 1, we know that the force given by the spring is just the constant of the spring multiplying the, the the, the displacement of the spring. If we want to be a little bit more uh, exact on the definition, we can always say that the spring has a rest length, a constant, QC, we can call it QC, is a constant, and QC also can take any positive value. But also we can say that the force given by, this, by the damper, Fb, that force, we can define it also as the gain of the damper multiplied by the speed. And we already defined this speed as the time derivative of, of course, the displacement. And here I have defined, finally, our, our, 
our input force F1, we have Fb, and we have Fk. We need also to define our convention. So what is the meaning of the summation of what is the meaning of the summation of the forces? So if we claim that our input force is positive, then there is action reaction that goes against that positive movement. It means that the mass by the acceleration, the mass by the acceleration, then it's going to be equal to the input force, one F1, minus the action reaction exerted by the spring, minus the action reaction exerted by the damper. Something that I haven't, I ha I haven't uh, defined yet is the meaning of the acceleration. What is the meaning of the acceleration? That's just um, the speed, the time derivative of the speed, which is just the time, the time derivative the of, the, of the speed, which is the, the, the second derivative of the position with respect, to, with respect to time. It means that our mass, which is constant, multiplied by the acceleration in terms of q, is going to be equal to u minus the constant of the, the constant representing the, the constant of the spring that multiplies the displacement of the mass minus the constant of the damper that multiplies the speed of the mass. This is a very simple system. It's the most simple system, one of the most simple systems we can think of. Now let's take into account, of course, this equation. This is our ordinary differential equation. And the idea is that we will, exp we will rewrite this ordinary differential equation in, a, in an equation represented by the energy function, in an equation that is just connected to the so-called Hamiltonian. And in this, in this short lecture, or in general, when we talk about energy, it's the same that talking about Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian function. So what is the meaning of that? So let's bring back the ordinary differential equation, the one that just, we, just, we just found. This ordinary differential equation, of course, then is the mass acceleration equal to minus k q minus b q dot plus u. We can rewrite it. We can say that also we can say that the mass by the acceleration plus k q plus b q dot is equal to the u is equal to the input force. This, in, this exerted force against the mass. What else can we say? Well, we have a mass, and this mass will, will face energy. And this energy, as I said, is going to be called, of course, it's going to be called Hamiltonian. And we can actually define the Hamiltonian now uh, in terms of the position. But also, we should define the Hamiltonian in terms of another state variable. So here, we have already make use, of what, made use of one of the state variables. This state variable is q, which is uh, an r, and q is, to, is um, dimension 1. But also, we can say that the mass experience momenta, and this is quite important in the Hamiltonian framework. And this momenta, we will call it P from impetum. And this P is just this P is just uh, mass by the speed. This is the key def the definition of momenta. And this momenta, of course, also is a real number. And also this momenta explicitly or will depend on, on time, but we, for simplicity of notation, we get rid always of the, of the time dependency. But it's a, it's a momenta that really changes with respect to time. Now we have the momenta. Now we can define the two energies that are affecting the mass. What are those energies? Well, there is a, a storage of potential energy, right? We can define 
the so-called potential energy. And it's well known that this potential, the potential energy then is in this storing element. And the storing element of potential energy for, for translational mechanical systems is the so-called spring. And this spring, the potential energy of this spring, we can just call it, we can call it um, VQ, and it's gonna be just one half of the constant of the spring that multiplies the change of the position to the power two. And it's in terms of joules. We have also elements of st storing elements in electrical systems for potential energy, such as cap electrical capacitors, or we have also potential energy stor uh, storage elements in hydraulic systems, which is also the hydraulic capacitor. But in this, and we also have uh, rotational springs for rotational mechanical systems. Those are three examples where the energy function that represents a potential energy is quite similar. But also we have the kinetic energy. And this kinetic energy, it's in terms of the new state variable, or yeah, the, the so-called momentum, and we define it as k as one half of the mass multiplied by the momenta, mass minus one, multiplied by the square of the momenta. It means that if the mass experience a movement, if the speed is different from zero, then given the fact that mass is constant, then the momenta is also different from zero positive or negative, changing with respect to time, which means that the kinetic energy also will be different from zero. Will be different from zero. And what is the meaning of this? Well, now we can define the Hamiltonian function as, a, as an explicit dependence of Q and P, the generalized coordinate and the generalized momenta, which is the summation of the energy that the system has, whether in, uh, the, in the potential or, or the kinetic. It means that the kinetic energy that depends explicitly on P and the potential energy that depends explicitly on Q, which means that the Hamiltonian function is just, it's just half m minus one P squared plus half constant of a spring by the coordinate, by the generalized coordinate, the, 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 the position that the mass experience to the square. So you can see that really depends on the Q and P with the generalized, score, this generalized uh, equation. So what's the next step? Okay, we have now the ODE, of course. We have our ODE. And we also have the description, the description of our Hamiltonian function. Now we have those two results. What can we do with those two results? Well, let's see. Let's bring them back to the next, to the next, next uh, screen. You can call it a screen. So one more time, we have our ODE. This was the result of the first, uh, the first screen. Um, by the acceleration plus plus k by the displacement plus b by the speed equal to the input and now we have the Hamiltonian function q and p which is just the summation of the kinetic energy the kinetic energy being um, m minus one generalized momentum square mass plus plus uh, k q square now let's, let's define something interesting here. Let's see what's, 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 what happens when we get the, the partial derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to both of the coordinates of the generalized, or generalized state variables. Meaning that we have already defined, of course, our two generalized state variables, Q and P. Position, generalized position, and generalized momenta. Well, what, it mean is, what, what is the meaning of 
the partial derivative of the Hamiltonian that depends on both with respect to with respect to the displacement, for instance. Well, if we apply that, it's simply k multiplied by q. What happened with we do exactly the same with q comma p with respect to the generalized momenta? Well, that's the so-called that's gonna be just minus one p. It's just a single partial derivative of the Hamiltonian function we have there. Now the interesting thing is that we can always replace momenta. Recall that momenta is just, then it's going to be just uh, mass by speed, which means that the partial derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to the generalized uh, momenta is just the speed. That's all. That's, that's the only thing. It's the speed. Now we have these two interesting results. We have, we have this result. And we also we have these results. Now, what happens when we replace both results just in this ODE? We can do the replacement of both results in the, in the, in the, in the, in the ODE. Also, another re interesting result that we can replace is the following. We say that the momenta is equal to the, to the mass by speed. What happens when we actually derive the momenta? The time derivative of the momenta then is going to be just mass by the acceleration, which means that we can rewrite, get rid of the of the acceleration in our ODE, and we just we can just replace it directly by the time derivative of the momenta. Now we do this set of replacements, and what we are going to get is the next. We will see that the result when we replace is just the dynamics of the momenta, the dynamics of the momenta uh, plus plus the partial derivative, the partial derivative of the Hamiltonian function q comma p with respect to its generalized, its generalized uh, coordinate q plus the partial derivative of the of the Hamiltonian q comma p let me have a little bit more of space here the partial derivative of h q comma p with respect to to q directly Plus, now I have to bring, of course, back this constant b. And now I know that q dot, q dot, then is just the partial derivative of the Hamiltonian, q comma p, with respect to p. And now, of course, this is equal to our input, our input force u. Now I can take, of course, this result. You can see now that I have rewritten our ordinary differential equation, and now our ordinary differential equation that represents the dynamics of the mass in front of an exerted force, it has been rewritten using, of course, the Hamiltonian function, the Hamiltonian H, but also I have rewritten the ODE in terms of our, our generalized coordinates, Q and P. I will bring this result now to the next slide. Now, the next result is, of course, the result that we just got is that our, the, the dynamics of P plus the partial derivative of H partial derivative of H that depends on Q and P with respect to Q plus B times the partial derivative of h of q comma p with respect to p is equal to u. Now recall this. This is one of the first results, our main ODE. And so we can rewrite it just in terms of the dynamics. And we can say, okay, then p dot is just equal to 
to minus the partial derivative of h, q comma p, with respect to q, minus minus b times dh q comma p with respect to q to p plus u. This is one of the first results, of course. But let's let's analyze the second result. What's going to be our second result? So recall that the momenta it's equal to the mass by the speed. We already obtained, of course, the dynamics of the momenta. Now the idea is to obtain the dynamics of the of the of the displacement of the generalized uh, uh, coordinate in terms of the Hamiltonian function. And what we do is simply is to extract q dot and to say that then this is p divided by m or it's just m minus 1 p. And this is just the partial derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to with respect to to p. Now it means that 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 our dynamics is just directly the partial derivative of q comma p with respect to with respect to p. Now we have of course we have the dynamics in terms of the Hamiltonian and we have the dynamics of the coordinate and the dynamics of the we have the dynamics of the momenta in terms of the Hamiltonian. And what can we do with that? Well, the next idea is to rewrite it, rewrite those two equations. I will include this one in the, in the most um, representative and, this, and the second one in the less representative, meaning that this will be the first row and this is going to be the second row. I will rewrite it in a mat matrix way, in a matrix representation. What is the meaning of this matrix representation? Well, I can define always a vector, a state vector, which is going to be called x. And this state vector is just going to be a column of the generalized q and the generalized p. I can rewrite that vector. Which means that the dynamics of this vector, q dot, the time derivative, is going to be just q dot and p dot the dynamics of both. Oh, and then what can I do with those, those two? I have already the results of these dynamics, q dot and p dot, which I have them here. Let's just rearrange these two equations in terms of matrices. Well, how do we do, do that? Well, we say then that this x dot, x dot equal to q dot and p dot is going to be equal to, recall that the dynamics of q dot is just the partial derivative of h with respect to qp with respect to, to p, to the generalized momentum, right? And uh, let's recall that the dynamics of p is just, again, the partial derivative of qp with respect to q minus b times the partial derivative q comma p with respect to p plus u. There is another definition, of course, before we write into the matrix, which is the so-called Jacobian, which is the, the vector that represents the partial derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to both, both state variables. It means that if I have defined my state variable x, I can also say that my Hamiltonian, it's also depending on x, which is also depending, which is also depending on, on q and p, because this is how I have defined it before in the previous slide, in the previous screen, which means that if I want to do the partial derivative of h depending on x with respect to x, then this is just the partial derivative of the Hamiltonian q comma p with respect to q comma p. And now we need to follow the rules, of course. What is the meaning of this? Well, this is just a vector that says that is the partial derivative of h with respect to q and p with respect to q and the partial derivative of h 
Q, P with respect to P. Well, this is the result in terms of both partial derivatives. Okay, what can we do with this? Well, I will define, of course, the inner matrix, the elements of this matrix, and I will define this vector. I will have use of notation. I will say just the H with respect to Q and the H with respect to P, and I will define another matrix that multiplies our input U. Now, where do I get information from those two matrices? Well, that information is actually here. We can find it here, right? So what is multiplying precisely Q dot in terms of the dynamics, in terms of the dynamics of the partial derivative with respect to P? Then it's just a one, a one. Nothing is multiplying, not, sorry, is nothing is multiplying, uh, this is multiplying with respect to P, nothing is multiplying the partial derivative of H with respect to Q, then this is a zero. Here we can see that minus one is multiplying the partial derivative with respect to Q, then this is minus one, and here we can see a minus B that, that is multiplying the partial derivative with respect to P. And also we can see that the input, it doesn't affect directly the dynamics of the generalized coordinate, which means that we can assign a zero here, but the input, there is a constant one that multiplies the input force that affects the mass. Let's not forget about the physical system. Then we can say that this applies for this row, which is one. And so this is what we have here is exactly the same. We have two ordinary differential equations and, and it's just written in a poor Hamiltonian form, in a matri in a matricial form. What is the meaning of that? Well, here we can see that this is going to be the so-called the combination of two matrices, matrix J, that normally depends on the state variables, and matrix R, that also depends on the state variables. We have here also the partial derivative of H with respect to the state variables, and we have here the so-called input matrix that also could depend on the state variables. In this case, it's just a constant matrix. And X, which means that we can always rewrite this system. We can always rewrite it as X dot equal to, I will write down a little bit down. We can always rewrite the system as, we can always rewrite it as, x dot, the dynamics of this physical system, will be just the a matrix jx minus rx that multiplies the partial derivative of h that depends on x with respect to x plus a matrix gx that multiplies, that multiplies that multiplies our input u. This is the first form of the, of the poor Hamiltonian system. This is the first form. This is the dynamical representation. Now, poor Hamiltonian means that we have ports, and ports always come in pairs. If we have an input, we should also define an output. In this case, we have an input u. And in terms of poor Hamiltonians, how we define the output? In this case, we have an input which is force. And so this input, uh, input output port, it's in terms of flows and efforts. If our input is an effort, our output is going to be a flow. In this case, we have u. u represents a force. It, represent, it can be also represent a torque for, for a rotational system. So, and this will, will be our so-called effort. It's gonna be our effort. It means that the output, then the output, and this is gonna be, of course, our input. It means that the, our output, the, it should be a flow. Our output, it should be certainly, oh, it should be a flow. So I'm, it should be a flow. So I, I recall that I have to, get myself away from that region. 
But okay, we can see, I will rewrite it in the next slide. But before I go into the input output, of course, I need to clarify what is the meaning of J minus R. J minus R. I haven't defined what is the meaning of this matrix J and this matrix R. What is the meaning of that? Well, it's actually very simple. We can rewrite our system, our, poor, our now, our poor Hamiltonian system, we can rewrite, of course, as, as Q dot, P dot, you can see here that one of the big advantages is that if you want to simulate this system, in order to synthesize, to synthesize a controller, you just need to solve uh, one degree uh, differential equation instead of solving two differential equations, instead of having, sorry, instead of having two integrators. You just need to have one integrator because it's only one uh, um, uh, derivative for Q and one derivative for P. This is one of the big advantages. So you will require less integrators. Now, as I was saying, then this is going to be 0, minus 1, 0, 1, minus 1, and minus b. That multiplies, of course, the partial derivative of h. plus the input matrix multiplied by the input. And I said, okay, so J X minus R X. What is the meaning of that? And I said, okay, this represents this represents this particular this this graph. Well this matrix, sorry, this matrix is actually the summation of two different matrices, zero, minus one, and minus b. This is just the summation of two matrices. And this matrix is just a summation of 0, 1, minus 1, 0, uh, minus 0, 0, 0, and b. Now this matrix is quite interesting. This matrix we can call it, we can call it just J. And you will see that actually this, if you have J, you compute the transpose of J and you multiply by its negative, it's just going to be exactly the same than J. So this is so-called, it's a property of the matrix, and it's the so-called skew-symmetric matrix. Skew-symmetric matrix. What is the meaning of this? Well, you can see that this matrix actually is inter it's interconnecting the state variable, the generalized coordinate, and the, and the momenta. So it interconnects, it makes the energy flow from one domain, from the domain of the potential energy to the domain of the kinetic energy. Recall that the kinetic energy depends on the, on the generalized coordinates and uh, the, the, the potential energy. And recall that the kinetic energy depends on the generalized momenta. This interconnection of energies, this flow of, from, from one domain to another domain is given is thanks to this skew symmetric matrix, this skew symmetricity. But also we have um, we have a matrix where we can see, and it's not really a coincidence, we can see that this matrix only depends on the constant B. Recall that this constant B is the element that dissipates energy. So one of the properties of this matrix R is that the matrix R can be, it's uh, the transpose of this matrix R is equal to, to, to the matrix again. And one of the the, the pro key properties here is that this positive can be semi-definite. It means that this R, it's always, it, it can be, it, it means that if you take any vector X, let's say X tilde, any vector X tilde transpose multiplied by the matrix R multiplied by the vector again, by the same vector, this is going to be always a scalar value which is going to be always positive or zero. Uh, so this is the so-called um, is the so-called positive semi-definite matrix. Positive semi-definite matrix. So all the energy that is being dissip dissipated in the system will appear 
in this matrix and all the interconnection and how the energy flows from one domain to another domain will appear in this other matrix. And this is the so-called J minus R property of the Paul Hamiltonian system. But also we have, of course, the input matrix. And you can see that simply the input matrix J normally can be more generalized. It can depend, of course, on the state variables. In this case, it's just constant. Uh, it's, it's the matrix that affects directly the input of the system. Now, I was talking uh, before about the, the fact that we need input-output port pairs, right? So this so-called port pairs in the port Hamiltonian systems. It means that if your input, so we can call it input and output and output. And you can have as many inputs and outputs as you want. They come in pairs. So if your input is a flow, then it means that your output is an effort. It means that your a flow can be a speed, a flow, uh, like a flow can be the, the, the hydraulic flow of a hydraulic system, or it can be an electrical current of, of an electrical system. But if your input is an effort, then your output is going to be a flow. And this effort, of course, is in term, uh, the effort in this case will be a torque or a force exerted to rotational or translational uh, systems or prismatic mechanical systems. This effort can be also the pressure that is being built in a hydraulic capacitor for, uh, for hydraulic systems, or this effort is the most common one in electrical systems is just voltage. This is the so-called effort. Efforts. In this case, we have U, and U depends U is just a force, right? So if U is a force, which is, is, is just an effort. It means that somehow the Paul Hamiltonian predicts that we, will have, we, should have, uh, we should have a flow. And what is the, the meaning of this? Well, it's a simple equation. We can say that, and with this I will finish, we can say that simply the, the output Y is equal to the output of the Paul Hamiltonian system will de will de be defined just as your as your input matrix tra transpose of the input matrix multiplied by this Jacobian meaning g uh, derivative of of the Hamiltonian function and in, uh, um, the partial derivative of the Hamiltonian function with respect to x and we have this information actually we say that then this is going to be just uh, 0, 1, which is the transpose of our input matrix that multiplies the h dq and the h dp. Sometimes I just don't use the, the dependency of q and p. I'm abusing a lot of the notation, no, but this is just for simplicity. And what is the meaning of this? Well, we do the multiplication and this is just the partial derivative of h with respect to p. It means that the output of our system is going to be just the derivative of h with respect to p. If we know that our Hamiltonian really depends on k q squared plus, uh, plus half of mine of m the power minus 1 by the square of p, then the partial derivative with respect to p is going to be simply m minus 1p, and this is just q dot. And what is the meaning of q dot? That's the speed that the mass is experiencing. And this speed, or this velocity, we can call it in, in mechanical systems for both rotational and prismatic, or rotational and translational, we can call it flows. This is a flow. Which means that our port pair for this particular system, this very simple system, is u comma y, which is just, of course, a force and the speed. And one of the particular um, characteristics of a, of, a, of a port Hamiltonian system is the following. Our Hamiltonian function is going to be always positive or zero. And if we compute the time derivative of this 
of this function, then, and I will, uh, I will let you, I will let you prove this. Then this is gonna be just equal to. This is gonna be equal to. Um, the, the derivative of h with respect to x transpose r x d h with respect to x plus the input of a system multiplied by the output, the input and the output. It means that a system that is uh, not conservative, it means that the Hamiltonian is going to be always less or equal to zero. Equal to zero if there is no dissipation, then it means it's conservative. But it's going to be less than zero if we get rid of the energy that is being dissipated by the R, which means the dissipation element. And with this, I'm finalizing the short lecture on poor Hamiltonian systems. For a very simple, very simple, you can see mass spring damper system with an exerted U. And we can see now that our output is just the speed of the system. And the output is used for control purposes. Sometimes we can also use the position for control purposes. If you have any question, feel free to send me an email to m.munoz.arias.ruch.nl. Thank you so much.